Today we're going to be tackling some projects which have been gnawing at me, investigating and attempting to fix up some broken Sun Microsystems equipment I have. Key word there being attempting. First, we have my Nemesis. This is a Sun PCI 3 Pro. This is an entire x86 machine on a PCI board. It's got an Athlon processor inside. This is meant to go inside of Sun servers. It basically allowed businesses to run Windows applications where they otherwise wouldn't have been able to on servers running Spark CPUs. I've seen this board successfully post exactly once, and I've been chasing that high ever since. We'll see what we can figure out with this one. It's not looking good, but you'll also learn why this compact from 2003 has anything to do with it. And then we'll have a look at a couple of broken Sunray thin clients. Sunrays were a line of thin clients that Sun put out starting in 1999. They're basically computing devices that hook up a mouse, keyboard, network, but they require a server to provide a session to do anything useful. This Sunray 270 was generously donated by a viewer named Jed, but it doesn't start up quite right, so we'll have a look at it. And finally, we have a Sunray 2FS that looks like total garbage. We'll see what we can do for this guy. Let's get into it. The story with this guy is that I saw it post once, and ever since then it's given x86 hardware failed to respond errors in the console whenever you try to interact with it with the OS. My current theory is that I fried the CPU when I booted it up that first time, so that'll be our first avenue of attack. In a Patreon video, I pulled the CPU off the Sun PCI to determine exactly what was in there, and it turned out to be an AXMS2100 FX S4C, an Athlon 1.6 gigahertz processor. At the time, the only way I could find to reasonably source one of those was via this, a compact Presario 2100. We'll look at that in one moment. But in the meantime, a viewer and patron, Rick, who has sent in excellent stuff before to save some of this Sun equipment, mentioned he had a very similar processor in his collection, an Athlon AXMS 1600FXS3C. This is a 1.4 gigahertz version of this guy, basically. From this point onward, I'm gonna call this the 1600 and this the 2100 for obvious reasons. So the game plan here is we're gonna pop open this compact. Hopefully it's got an identical processor to the Sun PCI here. Get that in there, and if that works, we'll take this slightly slower one and we'll get that in the compact and revive the compact as well. That would be excellent. One possibility here is that the compact CPU is also bad and doesn't work inside the Sun PCI but we have another option. As far as I can tell, this is a Sun PCI 3 Pro. It came with the 1.6 gigahertz processor. They also made a non-pro version that came with this exact processor that Rick sent in, which is incredible. So as far as I could tell, the boards are identical. There's no reason that it wouldn't be able to accept the slower processor, and I believe that's how Sun was shipping these. You'd pay a little more, get a little RAM, and get a slightly better processor. Speaking of RAM, if none of that works, it could be that this SODIM stick is bad. And so I've got a handful more that we'll swap in there and see. But let's get into this compact. This is a compact Presario 2100. The 2100 in the name has nothing to do with the Athlon chip. <laughs> That's just a coincidence. So this is a pretty nice machine. Came out in 2003, has Wi-Fi. But of course, what we're after is the Athlon inside. Flip it around here. I believe the CPU is here. I can see the fan assembly. These are all just Phillips screws. So what I'm going to do is start taking them out. This machine is missing RAM and a hard drive. I don't have a hard drive, but I've got some RAM, of course, as you saw, so hopefully we can get this thing to post. And like I was saying, it's got Wi-Fi, which is pretty fancy to have that built in in 2003, and if I remember correctly. All these screws have been the same so far, except for the ones on these covers, which is nice. Let's get the battery out. <laughs> Wonder if that still works. HP had bought Compaq by this time, so you'd still have Compaq branded stuff, HP branded stuff mixed in there. That probably accomplished approximately nothing so far. Laptops are pretty tricky to work on and they're all a little different. I'm really hoping I'm not gonna have to like pry plastic parts away from each other and risk breaking clips. That's never any fun. This is the hard drive bay. You sort of pull these rubber feet off, I think. Yep, those come right out. And I'm seeing more of them. So while we're here, I suspect these all have to go. Let's pull the hard drive screws out. And the previous owner left the screws for the hard drive caddy inside. So if that was you, thank you. Okay. And we're getting some, some movement. 
Ah, uh, the fun continues. Screws everywhere. That's the CPU in there. And you can see it's the two pieces are coming apart, but I'm still hung up. So, man, I hate working on laptops. I cheated and did a little Googling. There's always some plastic piece you have to pry up. I'd rather not damage this thing in any way. It's in pristine condition, and I'd like to also get it working. You know, pretty nice looking laptop. So we're removing this whole piece here, including these clips. Let's see how this goes. That's good. That wasn't too bad, actually. I would have never figured it out myself. My strategy here is that I'm removing this keyboard, by the way. There's a screw in here holding everything together from the middle. All the outside edges crack apart. Something's holding this up in the middle. And my best guess is that it's under the keyboard. Ooh, oh, that was easy. I'd rather not deal with this ribbon cable, but... Okay, that's out. Yeah, down in here, I think. We're getting very close. Undid this ribbon cable, probably for the touchpad, and... <laughs> Don't mind those sounds. Whole thing can reach up like that. This little guy pulled himself out as I did that just now. Here it is. Fancy heat tubing. I'm, I'm hoping this whole thing just kind of lifts up after I pull these screws off. Let's see what we can do. This whole thing needs to come out. Wow. I believe this heat sink was playing double duty with some chips here. So I had to pry and there was probably just thermal paste. Aha. Okay. <laughs> Straightforward. The moment of truth. Is that what I actually want? No, it's not. This one's an AXM J2800 FHQ4C. Who came up with these names? Anyway, it's a third variant. So that probably wasn't worth my time. Very excited to put this back together. This is a Athlon XPM 2800 Plus. The nicest out of, out of all three. <laughs> oh, we won't go down that road just yet. I think what we'll do is put this 1.4 gigahertz Athlon in here because we know that was a valid chip that Sun shipped with these PCI boards. We'll go from there. So let's pull this one. I'll also need to validate that this fan works. I wonder if I should just run it without the CPU in there, see if the fan works, see if I get the same failure mode. I would assume it's very similar. Yeah, let's pull this. Maybe that's what we'll do first. Uh, where is it? <laughs> I forgot that I hadn't put it back in the socket when I pulled it last time. It was in the box. Not that it matters, because it's probably bad. But here she is, the source of hopefully all our problems. The thermal pad wasn't horrendous, but yeah, just cautiously optimistic that I fried that thing. I do like the idea of running it without the CPU to see if we get the same behavior and if this fan spins. But before we do that, we're going to have to do the traditional RAM upgrade in that V240. This should hopefully max it out once and for all. The Sunfire V240. This thing came out in August of 2003, so it's 20 years old this year. And it might not be the fastest Sunfire, but I think it's my favorite, at least of the ones I own. So let's get the full 16 gigs in there. I'm a pretty big fan of 2U servers. The trade-off of size for flexibility is kind of the sweet spot. In here we've got the fan baffle. Lifts up like that. The story with this one is when I got it, one of its UltraSpark 3Is didn't have a heat sink on it. So I bought a heat sink, but that's, that chip had been fried and gave me no end of headaches. In fact, it's right here. I still have it. Once I figured that out, Rick, the same viewer that sent in that Athlon and that RAM, had some Ultra Sparks, and so he threw one my way, and we brought this thing back to its full capacity. He also sent over a bunch of RAM at that point, but one of the sticks was bad, this, or at least this machine didn't like it. So I think what I have in here, these are a couple of one gig sticks, as I recall. Yeah, these are one gig DDR, and Rick sent over a couple more two gig sticks with that Athlon, so Rick, thank you very much. Put these to good use, get this thing up to its full 16 gigs. Let's get the Sun PCI in here too. No CPU, fan plugged in. I want to know if that fan works. Don't know if I'm going to really be able to tell, but I'll try. This V240 has 
these little guys that you can slide to the length of your card for support. I think that's good enough for testing. I'm hoping I'll be able to feel this because I can't see the fan, obviously. Ah, uh, but I can. There's nothing stopping me from running it like this. There's no rules down here. Well, I think that'll do it. Serial management console. So I can see what it's up to. Uh, let's try it out. PSU is on, so it should be booting to the LOM. That seems to work. It's gonna turn off though. I don't think it likes not having a CPU in there. So we'll pull this, make sure the RAM's good, and we'll come back to the card. Hmm, even with the Sun PCI pulled, boots for a few moments, then turns itself off. Let's pull our RAM. Very strange. <laughs> Something with those new RAM sticks, hopefully just one of them. This is a known good two gig stick. I'm gonna put that in there. Let's see if we can power up. Yep, that booted just fine. Let's throw new stick number one in. Oh, okay, CPU zero dim three, unsupported CIS latency value. Okay, probably nothing wrong with the RAM. They might just be not compatible. <laughs> well, we tried, Rick. Pretty sure these are running at 333 megahertz. These are running at 400. That's my best guess anyway. These are probably fine. They're just not gonna work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, we'll be back in here again someday with more memory. Our friend here was not the culprit of the forced shutdown, which makes me feel better. Let's get it back in. We'll boot this up, try to talk to it, and what we should see is the same hardware failure, then we'll get the other CPU in. First, we'll need to get this old thermal pad off of here. Try to... Loosen it up with IPA, I guess. Might have to scrape. I've seen people use guitar picks, which is probably what I need. This will work, though. Yeah, I don't know. This thing wasn't in terrible shape. I don't have any replacement pads, so we'll have to use paste, which I think is probably fine. Okay. Let's install our victim. Pins look good. Which way does it go? Just like that. That's gonna make a huge mess, but better safe than sorry. Screw it down. And that'll be that. P240 is back on the top of the rack, plugged in, but not turned on. Let's see what we get. Here we are connected to the serial management console of the V240. If you're not familiar with these Sun machines, what we're going to look at is something called the ALOM or LOM Lights Out Manager. This was Sun's remote management utility for these Sun fires. So let's get logged in here. The LOM starts when you give the power supplies power. It's sort of a little computer inside the computer that allows you to manage the machine and boot it into other modes. As you can see, when it started up, it did some very terse tests. Now what we're going to do is tell it to power on. You can see it says host system has reset. Now the machine has power. We type console. This takes us to the OK prompt. And we should see the machine going through some additional diagnostic tests. So probing system devices, probing memory. This machine has one SCSI drive in it hosting Solaris with the Sun PCI software and the Thin Client software. I have mine configured to not boot right away because I'm always messing with it and everything. Machines should be healthy. We'll tell it to boot. This will take us into Solaris and I have the Sun PCI software running and what it's going to try to do is talk to the Sun PCI and we'll get that error from before if it fails. So this is kind of the moment of truth. We'll get into Solaris in a moment after it uh, does additional checks and hopefully we don't see that x86 hardware error. Uh, hardware reboot x86 failed to respond. Let me go play with my drivers. This is a Sunray, a Sun Thin Client. That V240 is also hosting some Sunray Thin Client server software that lets these guys log in and get sessions. The Sun PCI doesn't actually have a terminal based. I don't know what my monitor's doing here. Does not actually have a CLI, which is pretty lame. 
So let's run the Sun PCI software. Cannot open file. Oh, I have to run it as root. On the console, we still see hardware reboot x86 failed to respond. Well, I think my last ditch effort here is replacing that RAM. I got another stick of RAM in there, closed up the V240, powered it up, and same result. x86 hardware error. So, what have we tried so far? We've swapped CPUs, same failure mode, swapped RAM, same failure mode. In another Patreon video, I actually put this in a different machine. I put this in a V440 running Solaris 8, same failure mode. So that eliminates Solaris 10 as a potential issue. And then I also experimented with several of the jumper settings, one called hardware reset and one about strapping from the boot ROM versus hardware. No effect whatsoever. So that leaves me thinking I've got two options here. These BIOS chips might have fried themselves somehow, which would be unfortunate because A, we'd want to figure out why that happened, and B, it would require another Sun PCI 3 Pro. And then finally, a recap. So maybe one of these capacitors is blown. It did work briefly, so I don't think it's software, I don't think it's drivers. Something on this board went bad after I powered it up for the first time. Maybe in its life, it was new in box. And recapping is something I'm at least capable of, though I don't necessarily look forward to it. I've got some other recap work to do around here. I've got a Sunray 1 that's exhibiting signs of power supply cap failure. And then I've got several Blondertung RF modulators that also need recaps in the power supply department. I suppose I will get a big order of caps ready for those future projects. But unfortunately, the Sun PCI 3 Pro is going back in the pile of to-do projects. We learned a little bit about what's going wrong here. We know it's probably not the CPU, probably not the RAM. We'll have to revisit this when I get the new capacitors. But also in the meantime, you know, let me know what you think. Am I missing something? If I don't put this back together now, I literally never will. So let's at least see if we got a sweet laptop out of the deal. Well, at least I'm building up a sweet collection of early 2000s Athlons. Remember when the Athlon XP came out? Man, that was sweet. I was a big AMD guy back then. Yeah, I'm just gonna get the gunk off of it and then, uh, you know, fix it up, if you know what I mean. This thing is elaborate. Pretty cool. Nothing like working on a laptop to make you appreciate working on servers. Making reasonably good progress here. This one is real tight. Not sure how I'm gonna do it. Reverse my strategy here. Oh yeah, that thing is loose. That doesn't look good. I'm only missing one screw, if you can believe it. Now I don't have a hard drive for this thing. But I do have RAM, so we'll throw Infineon's Finest in here. Hopefully we can get this thing to post, just to see what it's all about. That's not working very well. That one did. There we go. Place your bets. It's thinking about it. <laughs> hmm. Lights up for a second and then turns itself off. Just like everything else I own. Well, let's move on. This is a Sunray 270, a thin client from 2006. A viewer named Jed sent this my way months ago. It's got a problem. Let's get it plugged in real quick. Turns on self diagnostics, check signal cable, then it turns itself off. Nothing on the LED or anything. We're going to dive into that, but first let me show you something kind of interesting. This is my working 270, and if we flip them around, mine was missing this back shroud, which I never would have known. <laughs> I did think it was kind of funny looking, but I thought, you know, whatever, because the Sun logo is here, always covered behind the shroud. Nice attention to detail there, but yeah, at the very least, got a shroud out of the deal. Let's dive into this thing. First thing I'm going to do is just power cycle it while it's connected to the network. The Sunray server is running, as you can see, on a Sunray 2 behind it. I don't think it's getting far enough in its boot process to be doing anything, but you never know. Maybe it'll try to bootstrap itself. So we'll turn it back on. Yeah, I don't think so. 
another thing to do is to try to get into a firmware reset dialog. And I think you hold control pause C when it's, when it's coming up. No. Okay. Well, we're going to try to crack this thing open and see if there's anything obviously wrong. I think this is mostly just going to be a fact finding mission. As we get into this, you will notice there are not a lot of screws, which means we're going to be doing a lot of plastic bending and prying and cracking, which always really sucks. Kind of had enough with that laptop, but here's what it is. That's how they like to cut. That's how they like to save money on metal. Okay. I think we're getting some progress here. There's probably a right way to do this, but best way I've found is you just kind of get at it. Oh, I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> we'll take off the easy shroud first. This one just has little clips, comes out when you pull it by hand. Uh, presumably this is so you can mount this thing to a wall or something. You would take these off. It's actually pretty nice that the base is easy to take off. I kind of appreciate that. All right. Base is off. Now we continue our prying mission. There's glue on the back of this one, which wasn't very nice of them. So I, I've gotten this far before. So this one was very hard to pry off when that glue was sitting there. I have no idea if you're supposed to, but we'll take these off as well. Now the real fun begins. We get to pry the bezel out. And I'm sure there is like a spot you're supposed to do this and a tool you're supposed to use, but I just have flathead screwdrivers. And so my strategy is make my way around. You can see we are making progress. Now this black front bezel is separate from the screen assembly itself, but that's kind of how you start. And then you pry a little more. It's little SIM card holders. Not helping. Okay. We've got two pieces. I'm going to unclip this. Must be the built in speaker. So now the back plate is off. What do we do now? So here's just the front panel and it's got a circuit board to drive it. Then client tells it what to display. There's a bunch of connectors here. I suspect these are not our issue. We would probably not see a display at all, or there'd be something garbled about the display rather than the computer telling us it thinks something is wrong. I think these are just power and the computer doesn't like it. It is, it was, you know, complaining about check display or something like that. See if we can look under here. Could this have become conductive? Did this tape break down over time? This is a really, really thin connector. No, I don't think so. <laughs> the act of messing with this thing might <laughs> solve our problem though. Power comes in on this side and this is some sort of daughter board with power stuff going on for the screen. An engineer at Sun that worked on these could tell us exactly what that error message means and probably point us in the right direction. All the screws are the same, which is nice. As you know, I'm a massive fan of companies making all the screws the same. I hate working on these guys. It's so easy to damage them. I'm sure I already have here. I've had to manhandle it pretty badly. My help to take these off. There is always something fun about being the first person to open up a machine since it was built. This one's pushing 20 years old, 17 years old. USB 
daughter board and the thin client with its video processing chip ati something cool i'm going to take a look at all these up close i doubt i'll find anything just glancing at it because everything looks really clean i'll be back nothing obviously wrong looked up a few things though this is the driver for the lamps the lights that shine on the screen so this probably isn't our issue i don't think the computer would be Smart enough to be seen if this is turning on the lamps, but I suppose you never know. This is off the shelf part. Sun doesn't make this. You can pick these up still. And over here we had this daughter board with the USB on it. And I thought this was going to be all USB, but these Realtek chips are screen drivers. So this is going to be integral to driving the video on the screen. And then of course the actual thin client, CPU, an AU1550. Alchemy RISC chip, I think, made by AMD at this point, I believe. And then an ATI ES1000 for the graphics. It's got these breakouts, no doubt for debugging or programming. I really need to get like a bus pirate or something to see, you know, in case these were serial so I could try to interact with them, but don't have that. So that's okay. We're going to hook it up on the bench here in all its parts and see what it does. What could go wrong? Got some plastic here, obviously on the bottom of the board so we don't short anything. Uh, I guess I'm just seeing if anything I've done, pulling plugs out, putting them back in, makes any difference. You'll have to trust me as I sneak under here. No, identical. Now what? This one's gonna take a little more thinking. Traced all these out, this cord's fine. Though I, I don't think anything down here is the problem. This is just driving lights, that doesn't matter, and it's doing it, so that's fine. We can see display on the screen. So this board is displaying what it's being told to display. That check signal cable is what you'd get in a monitor when the VGA cable is pulled out, you know? So I suspect something's going wrong up here. We're not driving the video properly into this board and therefore the monitor. So that's gonna be a tricky one. I mean, these are non-trivial boards. They're multi-layer. Yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that one a little more. It'd be interesting to poke around a little more, see if one of these is a UART or a JTAG for for programming, I wonder if we could talk to it somehow. Yeah, I'll put this on the back burner for a little while and mull it over. Definitely gonna need some more advanced techniques <laughs> than what I have in my toolkit at the moment. My hunch is that if I took a known good Sunray 270 mainboard here, popped it in here, all this would just work. So at the very least, I've got a bunch of parts and we learned how to take these things apart. This thing is our only hope today. This is a Sunray 2FS, the Sunray 2's big brother. And if you had this back in the day, you were top dog, like 100 base FX, fiber, ethernet, dual head, two monitors, DVI, primo stuff. Uh, as you can see, it's got some problems. It wasn't always this way. When I bought it on eBay, it was in perfect condition. And then the seller shipped it with this really heavy plate, poorly packaged, and it destroyed itself in transit. But I worked at a a little bit of a refund deal with the eBay seller, but long story short, I think I got to keep it in this condition, shipped to my house for less than 10 bucks. So I thought, yeah, if I sent it back to the eBay seller, they were just going to throw it away, which would have been equally as sad. I don't have any reason to believe it doesn't work, though it did get bopped around. I almost shouldn't even say that out loud. Let's plug this thing in and see what it can do. Got it plugged in. I see the Ethernet card came to life. Wow. It works. It is VPN. It's trying to VPN to 202.45.129.172, which is fine. We can factory reset it in a moment. It works. I just looked it up. Wouldn't you know it? That IP range belongs to Oracle Japan. So this was an Oracle unit. <laughs> Very cool. Another thing that makes this thing special are these DVT stickers and these stickers about not conforming to regulatory requirements yet. This would have been a design verification test unit. So probably really late in the beta testing or right before production runs of the 2FS, this guy would have come out as a design verification test unit. Really cool, so pretty unique. And that's why I wanted to try to save it. Let's try to get it open and see what's uh, rolling around in there. We will remain positive and look on the bright side. The fact that it's broken tells us a little bit how it comes apart so clearly there was a clip on this piece 
that went in here and got busted off. Presumably there are more along the way. Yeah, it kind of feels like it. I'd rather not break it any worse than it already is. <laughs> there might be more than one piece in there. I'm going to do this off camera. Also, I first noticed that on that 270, but these things have SIM card slots. I, I've had these things for months and I didn't know that. Got what I was after. It was the little shroud for the Java card. This glue got jostled out. Fits in there just like that. It's not actually broken. That's nice. Now what to do about this? I think, I think we can save it. I kept all the little plastic bits because I didn't know what I was going to have to shove back in. But this looks pretty complete. Let's glue this back together. I think super glue is going to do it. But if we get desperate, we'll pull out the big guns. What do you think? I'm going to let that sit for a little while. It's not perfect. You'll see that line. There's probably better ways to do it. I don't know. It's kind of got this paint on the outside. Might be kind of tricky. I need to look at the clearances in here and I'll try to glob some reinforcements in there, I think, on the inside. I mean, kind of liking what I'm seeing so far, though. Yeah, I think I'll get the inside pretty good. Already seems pretty strong. I'll leave that alone for a second. I'm also going to get the smart card shroud glued back in there. Hmm, I put it in backwards. Let's try that again. Same story, little reinforcements. I think that's okay. Of course we can see the crack, but that's no big deal. Now we have a slightly trickier repair. There's a light tube for the LED. And this little nub points out the front of here, like that. So it needs to be glued in there somehow, such that it picks up this LED, I guess, just like that. Maybe, maybe that was enough. I'll glue it in that way and hope for the best. I mean, I can't complain about that. Look at this. Good as new. You can, of course, see the crack, and I have to be careful with it, because um, all, not all its clips are here. But yeah, I think that came out great. Really happy with that. Let's see if we can get it off its VPN. When we power this thing on, we're going to try to get into the firmware reset menu. And it's control C pause on a Windows keyboard. It's a little easier on a Sun keyboard, but I don't have one. I'll point you at the screen and try that. All right, powering it on, control C pause. No, I successfully did this with a Sunray 270, but it wasn't running the Oracle firmware. I had older firmware. Maybe there's a different way to do it on these two FSs. Let me do a little research. Helps if you use the right key config. It's control S pause. <laughs> so VPN can turn that off here. We can see group was Sunray hybrid, mysunray.oraclevpn.com. Definitely belong to Oracle. That's kind of cool. The only other thing I checked was DHCP. That's on, that's good. Okay. Yeah, it's still trying to do something funny. Connect to a 172 server. Let's reset all the settings. Yeah, that'd be why. It's got a hard-coded list of servers. Out of the box, these Sunrays will use some DNS trickery to find a server on the network they're on. So that's definitely our problem. So let's just clear everything and see what happens. That's what we want to see. Welcome to V240. That's my Sunray server. And just like that, we have a session on the 2FS. Excellent. Well, this is great. That thing works perfect. The Sunray 2 family is complete here. I really like that it's got the dual head, dual monitors. We'll have to play with that in general with these Sunrays in the future. Happy with this repair. Really not that bad. I mean, you saw how bad it was before. So really excited I was able to save that thing from the scrap pile. And pretty cool that it was owned by Oracle, which means it, you know, of course, probably was owned by Sun at one point. That means I've got two Sunrays that used to be owned by Sun, this one and that 270 we were looking at earlier. Very cool.
If you made it this far, I hope you enjoyed this traditional messing around in the basement style video. As a reward, I'll let you in on a little secret. I've been adding a Linksys router to this stack back here in every video for the past few weeks just to see if anyone would notice. And now you're in on it. Jed and Rick, if you're watching, thank you so much for the generous donations. I know some of it didn't turn out as planned, but we will eventually get this stuff working and I really appreciate it. But in the meantime, I hope you all enjoyed this video and I hope I see you in the next one.